Hi, this is Colin Sandberg from Backbone Performance. Today I will be talking about strength training for cyclists. And before I start, I do want to say that I will not be getting into a lot of specifics here. This is more of a discussion of why strength training is important for cyclists and the philosophy behind it. But if you are interested in knowing more, you can check out my YouTube site for demonstrations of certain exercises. And at the end of this presentation, I'll also recommend a couple books for you. This is a little bit about me. It's my standard slide. If you've watched some of these webinars before, you've seen this before. I'm not going to be going over everything. But I do want to say here this. I am not a personal trainer. And just as I hope that people recognize what we cycling coaches do and that we're professionals and what we do as a craft, I think it's important to recognize what personal trainers do too. Uh, the devil is in the details. And that's what professionals do. Like I said, this presentation will focus on answering the question why and not so much how. <clears throat> this is a little bit about backbone performance. Uh, don't need to go over everything except to say we had a great 2012 and I'm hoping for an even better 2013. So let's get into it. Let's define strength training first. Strength training, it can mean a lot of different things. Most people when they hear strength training they first think about going to the gym lifting weights using weight machines possibly resistance bands something like a, a Bowflex machine although I'm not sure if they still have those around maybe somebody can tell me um, but strength training can also be just body weight it can be a Pilates class or it can be using a stability ball it can be jumping on and off of boxes and explosive motions which is what we call plyometrics and it can be done on the bike uh, some of the strength training work that we do on the bike is uh, big gear stuff, um, low cadence, and some of it, like standing starts, is more explosive power or sprint specific. Before I get too far, I want to mention, in case you don't already know this, that strength training is something that has been extremely controversial for endurance sports in general but uh, for some reason for cycling most of all and uh, really still is controversial um, although I think it's important that we be a little bit more specific here uh, as far as we're throwing around these terms strength training weight lifting gym work um, and also talking about what kind of that stuff we're we're doing here because I think um, you know not too many cycling coaches that I know will really tell you that they're against their athletes doing core work and against on the bike strength training and against plyometrics and against body weight strength training and everything uh, hands down <clears throat> certainly there's a lot that don't want to put a lot of focus on that stuff but I don't really know too many that think that it's harmful most of the controversy is when we talk about this this gym work weightlifting and really the more traditional strength training even more specifically uh, the the stuff geared at um, working on the the primary muscles um, for example, leg presses and squats, um, you know, stuff that uh, aimed at those primary muscle groups, um, and uh, whether it really makes you a better cyclist or not. So uh, here are the common arguments against it that I'll just quickly spell out. A lot of athletes are concerned, of course, that they'll gain weight, perhaps specifically in their upper bodies, and then, of course, they're going to have to lug that up the climbs. They may not be concerned that lifting is cycling-specific enough. What I've heard people say before is that cycling is an endurance sport, and with weightlifting, you develop different types of muscle fibers. And I don't really want to get too deep into the different types of muscle fibers and such, so I'll just sum up this argument by saying that a lot of people feel that strength training, at least when we're talking about working those primary muscles, develops the wrong kind of muscle and therefore won't really be a direct benefit to your cycling. Another argument that it, take is, uh, that it takes a long time to adjust to the lifting and you're not really getting much of a benefit unless you're lifting a lot of weight. In the meantime, of course, you either need to build up weight very slowly or you risk injury. And 
if you're sore all the time from the gym work, then your cycling is suffering, and arguably that's what really matters. Um, finally, it's hard to keep lifting once the racing season starts, and a lot of people have argued that if you don't continue your lifting, you lose the benefit of it rather quickly, perhaps. So, as you can imagine, I'm going to try to provide the counter-arguments to most of these things later on. But I do want to say that while I do prescribe strength training to my athletes, I think these are all legitimate concerns, and that's precisely why you have to do the right kind of strength training and the right kind of strength training for you. Uh, There are a lot of potential pitfalls here, and if you don't get it right, you might gain weight. You might not be spending enough time on the stuff that is more cycling specific and the the stuff that you really most need to work on. Um, and so all the time in the gym, you know, personally, I don't think that it's wasted time, but it's really just a matter of spending the time you have in the smartest way possible. So this is my summary of why I think strength training is important. I'll get into a couple of these bullet points in more detail in the next couple of slides. But uh, first, it helps us correct any muscular imbalances. We all tend to favor certain muscles or we favor the right side, favor the left side. And this may be because of genetics or maybe technique or whatever. But th- the problem is that over time, these imbalances really cut into our efficiency if we don't do anything about them. Second, cycling is almost exclusively in the what I call the YZ plane, which basically means that it's all up and down, and you get into trouble when that plane you get you get overdeveloped in that one plane and the other planes are underdeveloped. I'll get into that more in uh, in uh, slide a couple a couple down the road here. Uh, third. Non-weight-bearing athletes are all at risk for bone density problems, and that could mean osteoporosis later in life, but it could also mean that you're at risk for breaking a bone when you crash, and we all know that does happen. Um, You lose a lot of calcium in your sweat. Some people have have said over 200 milligrams of calcium per hour loss in the sweat. So if you're doing a lot of volume on the bike, you're not doing any weight-bearing exercise, and you're not taking a calcium supplement, it's uh, kind of a recipe for disaster. And you don't have to be 70 years old to have problems with this. Studies have shown um, even male pro cyclists in their mid-20s often have very low, dangerously low bone densities. <clears throat> By the way, there are other, there are two other non-weight-bearing, well, major non-weight-bearing sports, uh, swimming and rowing. But the difference is that most swimmers and rowers tend to do less volume in their primary sports and spend a lot more time doing cross-training and weight-bearing exercises. Next, uh, core strength. Core strength, which, and that can include abs, back, hips, chest, and shoulders, is important for just about everything we do on and off the bike. You can look at your core kind of as your your structure, your foundation. If you spend all your time strengthening your legs and uh, no time strengthening your core, it's kind of like, we say, trying to fire a cannon from a canoe or uh, the other analogy I use is putting a Ferrari engine in a Kia. Um, For those that are struggling with arthritis or other degenerative conditions, or if you've had a hip replacement, a knee replacement or something, you should look at those areas too as potential weak points, potential points of failure. And it's just like if you have a dam and you know that there's this one weak point, um, that's where it's probably going to fail if it fails. So what do you do? You bolster up that area around that weak point, and you try to disperse the load around it so it's not just concentrated on the weak point. <clears throat> if um, you work on strengthening all those connecting muscles as well as the ligaments and tendons around that area, it's going to help take the pressure off of whatever problem area that is. You'll notice that I put building and maintaining muscle mass pretty late in this list, and that's on purpose. That would, of course, be the reason that a bodybuilder or a power lifter would go to the gym. Um, but uh, 
you know, for a cyclist, most of the benefit of strength training, <clears throat> it's you can look at it kind of like cross training, except a more focused form of cross training. And uh, you know, th there are some people that do need to build muscle mass, even in the primary muscle groups, especially certain groups. Um, but you'll notice this is rather late in the list. Um, finally, there is a certain image of uh, cyclists. And I, I put Andy Schleck on here, and I put a picture of Andy Schleck. <clears throat> you can see, because to me, he best personifies this, you know, super skinny, toothpick arms, no upper body, uh, you can see through his skin and so forth. Um, and, of course, if you're trying to win the Tour de France, or if you have some sort of eating disorder, maybe you might want this. You might want to look like this. Most of us do not. We still do care at least a little bit about uh, looking good, and not just that, but we want to be able to pick up a box or... Um, you know, split wood, or maybe just take a walk down the street, or go bowling without being sore. It's not all about being a cyclist. Um, and we want to have a little bit of balance in our physique. And personally, I think you can do this and have some moderation. You can do it without putting on too much weight, if you do it right. <clears throat> I want to talk here a little bit more about muscular imbalances. First, most people do favor one side or the other, but not always, um, it, well, it, it's usually the same side as like the hand we write with. So typically, if you are right-handed, <clears throat> you're going to be right leg dominant and, uh, and so forth, um, but not always. Over time, you know, we develop that side more and more because guess what? The bike still moves forward even if most of the power is coming from just one side. And when we're in a race trying not to get dropped, we're not thinking about pedaling evenly with both legs. We're just thinking about surviving by any means necessary. Second, we we use certain muscles as primary force generators. For cycling, um, that's really, we're talking about the quads and the hamstrings, but we also use the calves, we use glutes, we use hip flexors to a lesser extent in every single pedal stroke. So if we've got really strong quads and really strong calves, or, or I'm sorry, really weak calves or really weak hips or glutes, we lose a lot of efficiency because those muscles, those secondary muscles fatigue, and we start what's called pedaling squares, which is really another way of saying that the force we're applying is really just up and down. Um, but nothing in between those sectors of the pedal stroke. And that becomes a problem because we're losing a lot of our power if we're not pedaling efficiency. Um, it's just going to waste. And and that's really the definition of efficiency. It's how much you put into how much of what you put into something makes it out on the other side. How much is lost in between. <clears throat> as far as um big versus small muscles we uh, we generally spend a lot of time working on those big muscle groups, which would include everything I just mentioned, except maybe for hip flexors. But uh, there are a lot of these small supporting muscles too, that if we don't, um, you know, we we won't develop them uh, as much. And if if we don't do that to support the big muscle groups, um, we're not. Again, we're not going to be able to use all of the strength that we have. That's what it's about. It's, you know, you work so hard with your training to make yourself stronger, you want to be able to use that strength. <clears throat> so let me explain more about what I mean about this um, planes of, of movement. You can see this, this little graph here, and you think back to geometry, there's really three planes. So you've got this XY plane, and, um, you know, here you can think of imagine if somebody was looking at you through a glass window and cleaning the windows, you know, moving their hands in circles, but all along the glass in that plane. <clears throat> in a um, more sports-specific example, you can think of most of what a goaltender does in, in hockey or soccer, and that, of course, of course, in all of these sports, there are 
it's not exclusively in that plane, but you can think of that movement. And you see the picture of, of, of Hope Solo down there blocking a, a, a penalty kick. That's what she's doing. She's moving laterally in that XY plane to block the ball. Um, for the XZ plane, you can think about that plane. You can think about the ice that the speed skater is skating on as that XZ plane and moving along that and um, you know how their legs push out to the side. That's XZ movement. And finally, you can think about a cyclist coming straight at you. Um, almost all of the movement with cycling is in that, that YZ plane, which means that you wouldn't really see much if you're looking at a cyclist from the front except that their legs going up and down. Um, the problem of course, is that cyclists tend to get overdeveloped in that YZ plane and underdeveloped in the other two. Um, and cycling, like any of these sports, does have some secondary movements, some, some secondary forces in those other planes, particularly when we're talking about sprinting and climbing, where you really rock the bike back and forth. So you need that lateral strength to make sure you can, again, actually use your strength actually use the the strongest muscles. Um, another way to think about this would be imagine if you had a two by four, uh, two inch by four inch piece of wood and it's five feet long and if you lay it down let's say across a, a hole in the ground so that the um, the uh, more narrow sides, the two inch part is at the top and bottom. Um, and then you put a weight on top of that board, you can put an awful lot of weight on top of that board before it breaks, um, you can, before it even bends, let alone breaks. But now, let's say, instead of a 2 by 4 you shave that down so it's still 4 inches wide, but now it's only a quarter inch thick instead of 2 inches thick. You lay it down over that hole again, and guess what happens when you put a weight on top of it? Um, even though it's just as wide and still that force is in that same direction, um, what's going to happen is it's going to buckle, most likely, and the wood is probably going to snap whenever you put any weight on it. And that's really what we're talking about here. Um, most of the load in cycling is always going to be in that one plane, that the YZ plane, but if you don't have some strength in the other planes, you basically buckle just like that board. Let's talk a little bit about core strength. Again, core strength includes abs, back, shoulders, hips, everything really in that torso area. <clears throat> you can think of it this way. The power on the bike really comes from your legs, but your arms are on the handlebars. They're controlling the steering and providing stabilizing forces. What's in between, what's connecting the two, is the core. So if you've got a weak connection there, you lose energy. It's the foundation. You know, if you think about, back to that car analogy, the core is like the steel frame of a, a car. And if you've got a Ferrari engine, you need to have a strong frame to put it in. If you don't, you can't use the power of your engine without just ripping the car apart. Um, if your core is weak, you start to get a lot of back pain, you start to get a lot of discomfort, and you may not be able to hold an aerodynamic position. Um, you're going to lose a lot of power, especially when you're really torquing on the bike in a sprint out of the saddle or on a climb. Um, I hate to use a picture of myself in my own presentation, but uh, no, no, just kidding. Uh, this slide basically explains how you want to look at strength training uh, a little bit differently as a cyclist. I think that my my personal opinion is a lot of controversy that um, arises as far as strength training for cyclists has to do with the fact that a lot of people they lift like bodybuilders or they lift like power lifters. And, and let me say, I have nothing against power lifters. I have nothing against bodybuilders. Um, I've talked to a lot of them at the gym. I've asked them for help on technique exercises uh, with, with different exercises and uh, looking for different ways to do something or give me some feedback on how I'm doing something. I think, you know, it can be a great resource for, uh, for you. Um, but, you know, if a bodybuilder is riding a bike, they're not going to 
do it the same way a cyclist does. It would be ridiculous for a bodybuilder to do a five-hour endurance ride or do attack intervals or something. By the same token, a cyclist shouldn't lift the same way as as a bodybuilder or a, a power lifter. Um, <clears throat> first goal, just like anything in cross training, is don't injure yourself. Uh, this is something you do to prevent an injury, but because it's not your primary sport, um, your technique, obviously, is probably not going to be perfect because you don't spend as much time on it. And because you're weight-bearing here, there's a much higher risk of injury. So you definitely, above all else, need to exercise a lot of caution. Second, you have to lift in um, a way that's not going to cause you to put on a lot of extra muscle mass. Now, here you kind of have to you have to know what kind of rider you are. Um, if you're a, a track sprinter, obviously it's not going to be a big deal if you put on, and it may even be desirable if you want to put on some more muscle mass. But if you're a climber, you got to be really careful. And you know, certain people especially have a predisposition to put on more muscle mass more quickly. Most cyclists in general, we tend to be underdeveloped in our upper bodies. So a lot of times it's not going to take a whole lot to start putting on mass in the upper body, but it's going to take a lot more to start putting on mass in the primary areas, in the <clears throat> mainly in the quads we're talking. So I think one common misconception here with uh, lifting for endurance sports is that you want to do super low weight and super high reps and in reality that's not going to help you much um, strength training is not endurance training you do your endurance training on the bike and a little bit with cross training not in the gym so you shouldn't be spending much time um, you shouldn't be spending tons and tons of time doing like huge weight and and really low weight, especially with the upper body, but um, you do need to do the higher weights. Uh, that is where you're going to get the most the most benefit. Um, and I, I want to say here, too, that it's important to realize even if you put on, for most people, five pounds of muscle mass, um, even if it's in your upper body, it's probably going to help you more than it hurts you. Uh, first, that muscle... It's probably going to help stabilize you. It's going to make you more efficient when you're riding. And second, um, muscle requires energy to feed itself, and so somebody with more muscle will burn more fat even when they're at rest. Um, cycling. When I talk about cycling-specific exercises, this is a little bit confusing of a term because, you know, really the most cycling-specific exercise is cycling. What I, I'm really talking about here is that everything you do in the gym and your strength training regimen should have a specific application on the bike, whether it's to help you develop fast switch muscle fiber or help stabilize you or help you make be more comfortable or prevent injury or whatever. <clears throat> um, next, you got to make sure your strength workouts don't take too long <laughs> because it is cross training. And no, just like I said earlier, you don't want to do anything that's going to take away from your primary cycling training. Um, and the, the main way to do that is to choose exercises that work muscle, work multiple muscles, multiple joints. Uh, for example, when you do a squat, you're using three joints, your hips, your knees, and your ankles. There's, there's three movements there. And you're working your quads, your hamstrings, your glutes, hips, as well as other muscles, uh, the, some of the smaller muscles, as opposed to doing something like a, a bicep curl that really is isolating one joint and one muscle group. And again, if you're a bodybuilder and you need to work on your biceps, probably would want to do exercises that isolate them like this but for a cyclist it's really just not an efficient use of your time and lastly I think it's important to be able to modify all of your strength training exercises without too much trouble um, that you can do them so that you can do them at home without buying a huge amount of equipment um, not everybody I know wants to get a gym membership, and for some, it's going to take a lot more time to do it that way, or it might be cost prohibitive. <clears throat> Here's a list of specific 
groups of athletes that may need to focus a little bit more on strength training. Um, women and athletes over 40 are going to have a more difficult time gaining muscle and they will lose it faster. Additionally, there tend to be more natural risk factors when we talk about bone density. And of course, the older you are, the more chance that you have uh, that you've developed an imbalance over time. If you've had a joint replacement or arthritis or some sort of degenerative condition, um, as I talked about before, I, I think strength training can really help be a big part of the long-term solution. You know, cycling is a sport that you should be able to participate in your whole life, and uh, um, that's great, but it's important to remember that over the course of millions and millions of pedal strokes every season, you can really aggravate a joint if you're not careful. Um, anyone who's experienced or experiences pain or discomfort on the bike, even if you're very confident in your bike fit, should be able to benefit from strength training. Although I do want to say here that uh, there's kind of a converse side of this, that even if you have excellent core strength and you have excellent technique, if your bike fits off, you're probably going to experience some pain. As far as different specialists, you know, for track sprinters and mountain bikers, the common denominator is high torque. This goes back to the planes of movement that I was talking about. Um, and although most of the forces in that YZ plane, there are these twisting forces on the bike too, which is which is why people talk about having bikes that are laterally stiff. And you start to see um, a lot of bikes with, with just huge, enormous bottom bracket areas, so it's laterally stiff. Um, it's because of those twisting forces. You know, if you take a rider, for instance, in a sprint, and you, you freeze time, or you take a snapshot of that that rider, and let's say their, their right foot is in the forward 3 o'clock position, this rider is generating this massive uh, counterclockwise twisting force on the bike. Twisting, you know, with all that force pushing down on that right side, it's kind of twisting the bike counterclockwise. So, of course, you need a bike that's stiff, so it doesn't flex back and forth and you lose power in the bike, but you also need a rider that's strong so that the rider doesn't flex back and forth, really. Uh, with endurance riders, <clears throat> long-distance riders, the issue really here is pretty simple. That you're, you know, you're holding yourself up in that position just for a long time. Um, I want to say a lot of people ask me, what the correct technique for holding themselves up on a bike is and what I always tell them is unweight your hands which basically means that you should support yourself with your core muscles so your hands are just nice and light resting on the bars um, but of course if you're riding for 6, 12, 24 hours at a time you better have a strong core to uh, to keep that up without a lot of pain and with time trialists um, really similar issue. The only difference here is that you're bent over more on the time trial bike, meaning there's a lower hip angle, so there's more stress on your back, and of course it requires greater hip, I'm sorry, greater core strength to maintain that. Here's some people that need to be a little bit careful. With younger athletes, I'm really talking about anybody who's still growing, although I do think that these younger athletes should still do some strength training. I would just say stay away from the really heavy stuff, um, and it's good to work with somebody too who can really instruct you on proper technique, um, especially while you're still growing. If you're really time crunched, let's say you're working over 60 hours a week, and uh, you might have, let's say, six hours per week to train, yeah, you should probably focus more on your cycling. But that said, <laughs> there are a lot of people that they they may not have time to add another three hour ride to their schedule, but they do have time to go to the gym because that's not weather dependent, it's not daylight dependent. Um, they might be able to do it at home, <clears throat> maybe even at school, maybe even at the office. And finally, older athletes, and this is a really interesting group because like I said in the last slide, these athletes have a greater need to do the strength training for a number of reasons, but they also have more reasons they need to be careful. Um, and uh, I, I just want to say here that 
one of the problems with a lot of studies you see in the exercise science fields is that they all seem to be based on people in their 20s and when you look for studies on athletes over 60 you don't really find much it's kind of disappointing um so i will say if there's any exercise science or kinesiology majors out there watching this uh maybe something to think about um especially as the the baby boomer generation is now starting to retire there's a lot of older athletes out there and personally i've been lucky to work with a lot of these people and um i i've learned a lot but it, it's tough because you know i'm a science guy i want to see the studies i want to see the science behind it and there isn't much out there for that group um so a lot of the knowledge really comes anecdotally or and i i don't mean this to sound the wrong way but it comes from trial and error um Anyway, I'll I'll get off my soapbox here. The the point is that uh one thing I do know is if you're over 60 and you want to continue to train, I really believe that strength training is an essential component and it might be desirable for a 25-year-old, but it's absolutely essential for a 65-year-old. You just need to be careful. So here's a short list of things to bring to the gym. You want to have shorts or flexible pants. I usually use yoga pants. You want supportive sneakers. Uh, a good pair of running shoes is probably fine. And a weight belt is desirable when you get into those higher weight squats and deadlifts and the explosive stuff like power cleans. Um, and it's nice to have a stopwatch because in some exercises like planks, you're holding a static position for a certain amount of time. If you want to do it at home, here's kind of a short list of equipment that you should you should think about. Um, a foam roller for the self-myofascial release stuff, an exercise mat so <clears throat> you don't get dirty from lying on the ground, and you have a little padding uh, for your bones instead of lying right on hard hard surface. A stability ball or Swiss ball, uh, really same thing there. Uh, for a lot of the core work, body weight stuff you might do, and it can help with stretching too. Uh, one note I'll make here with those stability balls is make sure you get the right size. A lot of people I've seen get balls that are, that are too big. Um, that doesn't sound good, but uh, don't read anything into that statement. <laughs> um, a medicine ball. It's good for certain exercises. You usually see these in two-pound increments, like 6, 8, 10. And if you're wondering what weight to get, I guess a, a rough estimate that I came up with would be divide your body weight by 17 for rough idea. Um, resistance bands are really versatile, and you can simulate a lot of different exercises with them. They're pretty cheap. They don't take up too much room. You may want to get a couple light dumbbells, even if it's just like a set of 5 pound and a set of 10 pound dumbbells. And finally, last thing here, <clears throat> you see this has a question mark, is plyometric boxes. Um, it has a question mark because real plyo boxes are pretty expensive. And um, you can find ways around this. If you have steps that are the right size, or you can go to a park maybe, or a stadium and use bleachers or something. This is a basic periodization schedule of the different phases of strength training. So you start with some cross training and uh, doing some more core workouts. Then you work into the stabilization phases. Usually that's two months. One for stabilization one, one for stabilization two. Um, really at this point, you're really just working a lot of those small muscles. You're getting your body ready for the bigger, higher weight stuff that you do in the strength and power phases. Um, strength phase is also divided into strength one and strength two. Each of them are a month long. Now, I'll say here, I think it's pretty easy for most people to do the transition and stabilization phases at home. But once you get into the strength and power phases, uh, most people are going to want to get a gym membership unless they have a really extensive home gym to do everything exactly right. The The power phase, that's when you get into the the most intense lifting phase with high weight, low reps, 
and more explosive exercises that really emphasize really emphasize technique so you really need a good foundation built up before going into that um, and then the maintenance phase is really during the season and I'll say that a lot of people at this point stop going to the gym and just do some core stuff at home or if you're like me you try to keep going for as long as you can but once you hit June or so it really starts to to disappear with the, the strength work um, that said I am not talking much in this presentation about on the bike strength training over gears and standing starts and stuff but I want to say I think that stuff is extremely helpful and as you move out of the gym it's uh, it, it's really essential that you start incorporating that that kind of work into your training a um, couple small explanations here on this slide first when I talk about circuits I'm not talking I, I'm I am talking about uh, running through a kind of one set of each of the exercises in a routine and then coming back and doing it again, um, doing the complete circuit. This would be opposed to doing one set of an exercise, then taking a little bit of a break, then doing the next set. For a number of reasons, doing circuits is beneficial if you can in the first three phases, but I, I also understand that a lot of gyms you go to, you're going to have to wait for equipment. Um, if it, it's fairly busy in particular, or if they don't have many of a certain type of equipment, um, so not always feasible, and that's totally fine if you if you do things individually, you do all your sets on one exercise instead of going through the full circuit. Um, the other term I want to define here is 1RM. Some of you may be wondering about what that means. That means the maximum weight you can lift for one repetition on a given exercise. So then we base off, we base how much to lift on other exercises based on that as percentages of that. Um, I usually recommend that athletes are not doing 1RM testing because there's a lot of risk of injury. Um, better in most cases just to estimate it and really always err on the side of caution. And another rule of thumb you can use if you want to get a little bit more precise is typically if you know the max you can lift for 10 reps you can just add 25 percent to that to get an approximation on 1 RM this is the routine in a typical strength workout um, and for me if I go through this whole thing it's going to take about an hour and a half for most phases of the strength training maybe closer to an hour for the maintenance phase um, you got 10 minutes of aerobic warm-up that could be on the treadmill or, or some other sort of aerobic warm-up, um, some other machine maybe. Then self-myofascial release, that's a foam roller. Then, uh, and, and the self-myofascial release usually will take about 5 minutes. Uh, dynamic stretching, which should take about 10 minutes now. A little bit on dynamic stretches here. These incorporate some movement into them, so they're somewhat aerobic, and you'll continue to sweat after your your warm up. Um, should help loosen you up, and you get a little bit of core work in there too. Um, should take generally about 10 minutes with the dynamic stretching. Then you've got your main sets. Uh, most of the routines that I prescribe will take about 25. If you're doing a circuit, it'll take about 25 minutes per set. So if you're doing two sets, that's 50 minutes. Uh, then 10 minute aerobic cool down. I always like to do that on the bike or something bike like, you know, a stationary bike at the gym, a spin bike, whatever. If you're at home, maybe the rollers. And lastly, about five minutes of active stretching. When I say active stretching, that means you get a little bit of assistance either from another person or uh, using a, a belt to help with those stretches a little bit. Lastly, I want to share some general tips for strength training. Um, first, I, I, I really can't emphasize this enough. It will really help you to hire a professional, at least for a couple sessions. Maybe at the beginning of each new phase you start, they're going to show you how to do the exercises right and avoid injury. They might show you some different variations, too. Um, 
you just want to make sure that whoever you work with really understands that you're a cyclist. Your goal of doing this is to become a better rider, not to look like uh, you know, Mr. or Mrs. Universe. What I usually tell athletes is to show your personal trainer the strength training plan that I give them, and um, they can show you how to do the exercises the right way, or maybe they'll suggest some different variations for you based on your specific needs or something they might see with you. Um, next warm up, well, you know, <laughs> if you go through that that past slide, you see that's 25 minutes of warm up before you even touch a weight. There's a reason for that. Um, next, and this is really a big one, hence the exclamation point: slow it down. You'll get a lot more value out of doing five reps with good technique than 20 with bad technique. Um, when you do things too fast, what happens is the momentum of the weight carries it through, and it's and you're not really using the muscular strength that you're trying to to benefit with. Um, so you kind of nullify a lot of the benefit, if not all of it, and of course you risk injury. Um, I would say if you can't do the exercise slowly with the right technique, with good technique, very simple answer: use less weight. Uh, do core last. This is because, like I said before, you, you use core indirectly for just about everything. So if you do an intense core workout and then you go over and do squats, you're going to be really shaky and sloppy, maybe injure yourself. Um, there's certain exercises where you really have to focus more on good technique. With, with core stuff, your technique doesn't have to be perfect, so you'll still get the benefit even if you're feeling a little tired from the exercises you did before. You just got to make sure you slow it down enough and you're not going too fast. Um, but one thing you really do want to focus on with technique and all of these exercises is spinal alignment. Um, meaning, should your back be arched, should it be rounded, or should it be neutral, should it be straight? Um, and with certain exercises, this is absolutely critical. For instance, if you're doing a squat, you want a, a uh, an arched back. If you want, uh, if you're doing bench presses, you want a, uh, a rounded back. That's why a lot of people you'll see when they're doing bench presses will put their legs up, or put their feet up on the bench to make sure that the back stays in that uh, rounded position. And if you're doing um, rows, you want a neutral back. Um, if you don't get these right, you can pinch a nerve or something and you can really mess yourself up, especially with higher weights. Now, I want to get back a little bit to the the uh, high weight, uh, low rep versus low weight, high rep thing here. I want to make this as simple as possible. When it comes to the major muscles, it's going to be the high weight, low rep stuff that really benefits you and builds the muscle. But, and this is a big but, you have to build up very slowly and focus on your technique before you can really do that. And even when you do get there, it's really only a few months out of the year that you're really doing that high weight, low rep stuff. Um, one of the guidelines I like to use is that you should never use more weight than your technique can handle. If you can't do it with good form, lower the weight. Um, when I say there's many ways to strengthen a muscle, what I mean is that if an exercise is aggravating something, maybe it's an injury, um, there's probably another way to do it. and a way that won't cause a problem there. Also, if you feel like you've mastered something, you feel like you mastered an exercise, and you want a little bit more challenge, um, with most exercises there are variations and ways you can challenge yourself more. A lot of times it's by adding a balance element to it, but again, this is an area where working with a personal trainer, at least from time to time, can really help you. Uh, it's not all or nothing. We're all competitive people, and I think that generally we look at our training plans and we want to give it our best shot to do every workout 100%. But we live in the real world, too, and work, school, family, um, recovery, and lots of other things get in the way. Um, most often what I hear from people is, well, I was busy, so I skipped my strength training. And what I say is, okay, 
maybe you didn't have time to go to the gym for an hour and a half, which, of course, may actually be two and a half hours when you factor in packing your bags, getting changed, driving there, doing the workout, taking a shower, changing back, uh, driving home. Uh, might be closer to two and a half, but maybe have an hour and maybe you can just do one set instead of two or three sets. Maybe you could cut out the active stretches at the end or cut out the self myofascial release or you cut down, maybe eliminate the cool down. It's not ideal, but it's a lot better than nothing. Or maybe you say, I, look, I only, even, I only have 20 minutes and even there, plenty of time to do a core workout at home. Um, maybe you don't even have that. But even still, if you can do a plank for two minutes in between homework assignments or on your lunch break, that's a lot better than nothing. Um, the point is doing something, even if it's not ideal, is way better than doing nothing. Uh, last thing I want to say is it's really important to know yourself. Do you like going to the gym uh, or do you hate it? Would you rather stay at home? Or are you the type of person that's really just going to procrastinate your workout if you do that? Do you feel better in the morning? Do you feel better in the afternoon or the evening? Do you like doing workouts on your own? Or do you do better when you have a training partner? Um, do you like traditional dumbbells and barbells type stuff? Or would you rather do TRX and CrossFit? you got to be honest with yourself because you can only force yourself to do workouts you hate for so long. I wanted to put this slide up a, a little bit earlier, but I figured I would just put it at the end instead. Um, I, I do want to make it clear, like I said at the beginning, I am not a personal trainer. I've read a lot of books on strength training for cyclists, and... What I've found is that the the second edition of the Doyle and Schmitz book is the I think the best thing out there. Um, and that's why I base most of my strength training programs off of this book. Um, of course, if you want to know the specifics, get the book. The uh, the cycling anatomy book here is a really cool book because there's a lot of exercises that they show really just about anything you can imagine that a cyclist might do and there's diagrams of, of which muscles you're working in each of those exercises and then next to that is a picture of a cyclist on their bike and you see where those same muscles are uh, being highlighted you know how how they're used on the bike and in what situations um, and uh, I want to give a little bit of a, a shout out here to, to Max Calder. He runs Yo Max Fitness. And uh, that's just really because I, I think he's one of the best, if not the best personal trainer in the Philadelphia area. And he's got a great website you can go check out. He's got some really nice videos demonstrating a lot of different exercises. It goes into depth with each one and proper technique and different variations you can use. Um, I would also add that he is a, a bit of a cyclist himself. So if you go to Max, he'll he'll understand that being a cyclist and doing strength training is a lot different from being a bodybuilder. Um, finally, I want to mention I am in the process of putting some videos up on my YouTube channel, the Colin Sandberg YouTube channel. Uh, um, going through some of these strength training routines. I will say, before you check these out, understand that they are amateurish. They're filmed in my living room with uh, with an iPhone. Uh, but I I just put them up there because, or I'm in, I am putting them up there because I, I found time and time again when I talk to athletes about strength training, they tell me, oh, everything's fine. But then I actually do a workout with them, and I find they're making a lot of mistakes and not necessarily interpreting everything correctly. So... Hopefully, these videos will help a little bit with that. Um, and, and I would also say that YouTube in general is a great way to look up different exercises and see what they are if you don't know, if you don't know the terminology, and see the, the proper technique to do them. Um, you need to be a little bit careful about what you're looking at, but there are lots of personal trainers out there that, that post stuff on YouTube, some, some really good stuff on YouTube. 
Okay, for more information about Backbone Performance, you can check out our website, backboneperformance.com. If you're a junior or the parent of a junior, uh, check out the Young Mellis website. You can check out my blog. You can subscribe to my Twitter feed. Or if you've got a question or a comment, just uh, email me. Um, I really welcome any questions or comments you have. Thank you.